living water that only he can give from everlasting springs that won't run dry living water you'll never thirst again the water's free just one drink and you will never die
on me all week about stuff. I had no idea really what I was going to preach on, and, and that's usually the best way if I let you know God, God determine that. And all week long, I, he just kept talking to me about mercy and grace and grace and mercy, and I'm thinking, I get it, Lord. I know. You know, I know your grace is enough for me. And then we sing the song this morning, you know, Jehovah Jireh, his grace is enough. And, you know, we can't buy, we can't do enough work. We can't, God's grace is just there for us to accept and take. So this morning I'm going to preach on God's grace and mercy. And I've entitled the message, It's All About the Grace. And the parable, you know, Jesus taught in parables, and this parable just kind of popped out at me when I started looking at grace and mercy in the Bible. And you do that sometime and see how much is in the Word of God about grace and mercy. But the parable of the workers in the vineyard in Matthew 20, verses 1 through 16. And I'm going to read that, um, 16 verses to you now. It says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them in dineros for the, day, for, the day and sent them into the, for the whole day and sent them into the vineyard. About nine in the morning he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go to work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. People were standing around doing nothing. He said, I'll pay you. Go into my vineyard and work. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. And he asked them, why have you been standing here all day and doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came in and each received Daenerys. So when those who came in were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received the same. Daenerys. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only an hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friends. Don't you agree to the work for a Daenerys? Didn't you agree to work for a Daenerys? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I went on, want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. I want to share with you some, some illustrations today that also go with this besides the Word of God. And, and one, uh, a man that used to be the chaplain for the Senate, his name was Everett Hale. Someone once asked him, do you pray for the senators? Dr. Hale? And his reply was, 
No, I look at the senators and I pray for this country. We all need to receive God's grace. It's all about the grace. I once read a story about a mayor of uh, New York City, Ferrario LaGuardia, who the airport is now named after. He was the mayor of New York City during the worst days of the Great Depression and World War II. The mayor was called by many New Yorkers the Little Flower because he was only five foot four and always wore a car carnation in his lapel. He was our own little Pastor Tim without the flower. You know? <laughs> That'll be edited out, I'm sure. He was a colorful character who, who used to ride the New York City fire trucks. He'd raid speakeasies with the police department, take entire orphanages to baseball games. And whenever the New York newspapers were on strike, he would go on the radio and read the Sunday funnies to the kids. One bitterly cold night in January 1935, the mayor turned up at night court in an area that served the poorest ward in the whole city. LaGuardia had dismissed the judge for that evening and took over the bench himself. Within a few minutes, a tattered old woman who had, was brought before him, charged with stealing a loaf of bread. So LaGuardia told, so LaGuardia, so she told LaGuardia that her daughter's husband had deserted her. Her daughter was sick and the two grandchildren were starving. But the storekeeper from whom the bread was stolen refused to drop the charges. It's a real bad neighborhood, Your Honor, the storekeeper told the mayor. She's got to be punished to teach others around here a lesson. The mayor sighed. He turned to the woman and said, I've got to punish you. But even as he pronounced sentence, the mayor was already reaching into his own pocket. He extracted a, he had, he had sentenced her to $10 or 10 days in jail. So he was reaching in his own pocket and he was pulling out a bill as he was handing down the sentence. And he goes, here's the $10 fine, which I now remit. And furthermore, I'm going to fine everyone in this courtroom 50 cents for living in a town where a person has to steal bread so that her grandchildren can eat. He then said, Mr. Bailiff, collect the fines and give them to the defendant. All while 70 petty criminals, people with traffic violations, and New York policemen, all of whom had just paid the 50 cents, gave the mayor a standing ovation. The following day, the New York City newspapers reported that $47.50 was turned over to the little old lady who had stolen the loaf of bread to feed her starving grandchildren, and that only 50 cents of that amount was contributed to the Red Face grocery store owner. The question is, did the elderly lady in the story get what she deserved? The answer is no. She stole the loaf of bread. And yes, she may have had a reason, but stealing is stealing. And regardless of the reason, the punishment would have been in order. What we're seeing in this story is grace. Amen. Grace extended to others. So we know, we know that God's grace is enough for us. We know that his mercy is plentiful. But too often, we don't extend grace and mercy to those around us. I don't know if God was trying to tell me something this week. Maybe I'm not extending enough grace and mercy to the people in my life. You know, grace is, one, is when one shows kindness and mercy to another. The mayor, rather than demanding punishment of the woman herself, paid the fine and then further helped her cause with the collection of the 50 cent fines and gave her the money. It was more than she deserved. It was grace. That's what the gospel text was I read about this morning is all about. It's all about the grace. The parable of the workers in the vineyard is a parable Jesus says in the parable, Jesus says that the kingdom of heaven, like a landowner, that went out and hired workers for the vineyard. Some he hired early in the day, telling them 
that he would pay them the usual day's wage. Going back at various times of day and seeing people standing around and still hiring them and sending them out into the vineyard and promising them to pay them. We're not told why some had not found work or if they had shown up at the marketplace late or, or the reasons why or any other details. At the end of the day, he came to pay the workers and he began with the ones most recently hired and he paid them a full day's wage. The, that excited those who had already been there all day and they thought that surely, surely he would get more. They thought that they would get more than those who would come late. And he obviously would pay them even more for all the hard work they had done. But that excitement was shortly lived. In fact, they were pretty upset when they got the same pay for the same working all day and all those hours. And when the landlord, landowner heard him grumbling, he tried to explain it. That it was not unfair at all. He gave them what they agreed to. It was his money, and he could be generous if he wanted to be generous with it. We're not told how those workers responded to his comment. It would seem that the landowner did not know much about business. For the next time he went out to hire people, none would probably go to work until the last hour of that day. But the, what the landowner did was did know about was grace. The workers that came at the end of the day did not get what they deserved. They got mercy. And mercy is at the very heart of grace. What would have been fair would be to pay the workers that came late less than a daily's wage or pay those who had worked all day more than the daily wage. That would have been fair. But of course in the parable the landowner is God. The workers are us and the pay is the kingdom of heaven. It doesn't matter when you come to God. It doesn't matter if you've been a Christian for 60 years or six days. God's grace is the same for all of us. So first in that parable it says that the grace is received and not deserved. And that's why I said we can't buy it. We can't work for it. We don't deserve it. It's given to us freely. For all of us who are people of faith, we know that we don't deserve it. We don't deserve God's grace. But are we thankful for it? And I wrote nothing, and I underlined it, and I made it bold, and I capitalized it. Nothing that we can do will put us in a position of deserving God's grace. All we can do is receive the gift that God offers to us freely. There's no price tag. It's free to us. We don't need to open up our wallets. We don't need to come to church every day. It's given to us freely. There's a book I once read, Healing Grace, written by David Siemens. And there's a story in that book, and it says, For more than 600 years, the Habsburgs exercised political power in Europe. When Emperor Franz Joseph I of Austria died in 1916, he was the last, it was the last of the, uh, his funeral was the very last of an extravagant uh, imperial funeral. A profession, or processional of dignitaries and eloquently dressed court persons escorted the casket draped in black and gold imperial colors. The, the accompaniment of a military band procession and by the light of torches, the somber group descended the stairs of the Capica, the monastery in Vienna. At the bottom of the great iron door leading into the family crypt, behind the door was the cardinal, the archbishop of Vienna. The officer in charge followed the prescribed ceremony that had been established centuries before. He cried out, open! Who goes there, responded the cardinal. 
We bear the remains of the imperial and apostle Lessic Majesty France Joseph I, by the grace of God, Emperor of Australia, King of Hungary, Defender of the Faith. The officer continued the list of Emperor's 37 titles. We know him not, replied the Cardinal. Who goes there? The officer spoke again, this time using a much abbreviated and less uh, uh, amount of titles and, and, and received uh, reserved the times for expectancy. And the reply again was, we know him not by the Cardinal who goes there. The officer tried a third time, stripping the empire all but of the humblest of titles. We bear the body of Franz Joseph, our brother, a sinner like us all. At that, the door swung open and Franz was admitted to the crypt. No matter who we are, what titles we have, how much we have, none of it can open the way to God's grace. It's given freely. What is left for us to openly receive that grace? That's all that's left. It's there. We have to openly receive it. Grace is received and not deserved. Grace, God's grace is about mercy, not about fairness. And when we speak about grace, it's about something different than fairness. It's about mercy. God loves us and mercifully gives us more, so much more than we deserve. Jesus took what we deserved. There's a consultant that's a Christian consultant, a financial consultant, and he speaks in a book that he's written, Business by the Book, about going the extra mile, going beyond fairness. And earlier in his career, he, he leased an office in a building that was proved to be a nightmare. The foundation had not been properly constructed, and the office building was literally sinking several inches a year into the ground. After more than three years of putting up of, with associated problems, including power failures and several weeks without water, and he moved out of his business to another location. Two months after he left, he received a call from the former landlord who demanded that he remodel and repaint the entire office space. Mr. Burkett said no, feeling he had already been more than fair with the landlord. But the former landlord continued to call with his demands. Mr. Burkett consulted an attorney who agreed that Burkett had fulfilled his responsibility and should not allow and do anything further. He then went on to say that his son ordered, offered him some different counsel from his son. His son reminded him that the landlord and his wife had lost their only child a few years earlier and still suffered from that tragedy. Mr. Burkett had often commented that he would like to help them heal through, this, through their loss. So his son suggested that he might be an opportunity to do just that by doing what was fair by not doing what was fair, but what was by merciful. Mr. Burkett said he considered what his son had said. He decided to commit several thousands of dollars to restore a virtually non-usable building. That's go Church, this is going beyond fair. It's being merciful. Grace is received, not deserved. Secondly, grace, God's grace is about mercy and not about fairness. See, all too often we're walking around with the gavel and we're ready to proclaim judgment on our friends and our family and the people we know around us or somebody that's hurt us. But God's grace and mercy is upon them as well as us. They just need to receive it. And thirdly, God's grace is for the last as well as for the first. You know, it's easy for us to say that we deserve more because we're the people who have been faithful in the call of Christ in our lives. Yet God does not work that way. Today and every day, God wants a relationship with everyone, from the poorest beggar on the street, or criminal on the street, to the fanciest penthouse owner or billionaire. He wants a relationship with each and every one of us. 
And this, that's what grace is all about. You know, some years ago I listened to a story, a testimony that I believe also illustrates this point very well. And I'm not going to share the name of this person. Um, many of you probably don't know her. It wasn't even around here. It was on our uh, a trip down to West Virginia. But she had shared with me that her father had sexually abused her as a small child. She grew up, overcome the emotional damage and had been, that had been done to her. She became a Christian and she eventually married. Years later, after her own children were fully grown, she received a letter from her father telling her that he had become a Christian and had asked God for forgiveness. He also realized that he had sinned against her and was writing to ask her for forgiveness. Feeling she didn't know where to, how to handle the feelings that had suddenly surfaced. She didn't, she just, it was overwhelming for her. Even though she had known God now for several years and stuff like that, had come to the Lord and, and knew about forgiveness and attended church and heard sermons on forgiveness, feelings surfaced that she just didn't know how to handle. It wasn't fair, she thought, being very bitter. He should pay for what he had done. It was just too easy, she thought. And now he was going to be a part of the family of God. She was sure that her home church was busy killing the fatted calf for her father and that he would be invited to come to the very party. And she was angry, she was hurt, and she was resentful. And then she shared with me a dream that she had where she saw her father standing on an empty stage. Above him appeared the hands of God holding a white robe. She recognized it as once because in the dream she was wearing a white robe just like it. As the robe began to descend toward her father she woke up with tears streaming down her face. The only way she could get past it all was to realize that her earthly father was now the same as her in God's eyes. That we're all the same in his sight. God's grace was with him just as it was with her. Realizing that he was fi she was finally able to forgive her father. You know, grace is a free gift that we receive. It's not what we deserve. It's about mercy, not fairness. It is for the last as well as for the first. You know, and those of you who were here for Dean Braxton, you remember, we're going to be surprised about the people we see in heaven. You know, people we have condemned, people we have judged to not be fit for the kingdom of heaven, but God's mercy and God's grace. And none of us know the connection or the, 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 that person that is passing the connection to the very last moment as they may have given their life to Christ. Hebrews 4.16 says this, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Every time you extend mercy and grace to people that you encounter in life, you come that much closer to living out your purpose for God. By extending mercy, you show love and genuine care and concern instead of negativity and condemnation. By extending grace, you give something good to someone who does not expect or deserve it. Giving and receiving, heaping measures of mercy and grace, you bring forth the love of God to those who need it the very most. You can be a vessel of change in their lives. You find God's purpose for your life when you put the needs of others first. And by doing this, you're extending mercy. That's hard sometimes, isn't it? It can be challenging tasks because it's easy to extend unconditional mercy to a spouse or a parent or a child, but extending mercy to others outside that family circle requires work. 
You find your purpose and your honor and honor God when you step out of your comfort zone and act with mercy regardless of how easy or challenging it is. All too often we get settled into a comfort zone and, and even as Christians we put up a wall and say, oh, I'm not going there. But God wants us to go there. He wants us to step out. Maybe it means taking the last $2 out of your pocket and giving it to somebody. Maybe it means that we have to go without something for a period of time, for a while, so that others can have. Extending unconditional grace delights the heart of God. When you forgive someone who has hurt you, you're extending grace. When you give to someone who least deserves it, you're extending grace. God demonstrates many times how to give without counting the cost. He graciously gave the Garden of Eden to Adam and Eve. He graciously gave his son to all of mankind. God gave you his best, and he gave it without worrying about what it would cost him. He gave with joy, and that's what he expects from us, to give with a joyful heart. Love in action confronts, demonstrates, it, it, love in action will comfort people, it demonstrates kindness and improves the lives of those around you. Given in action also heals and demonstrates the true heart of God. And my challenge to you is this. I'm going to wrap this up here shortly. My challenge is this. Each day, one way, in one way, find a way to extend mercy and grace to others. Before you know it, you'll have created a habit that will not only enrich the lives of others, but that will greatly impact your life as well. It's all about the grace, church. It's all about the grace that Jesus Christ died upon the cross and has given to us. He gave it to us freely and unconditionally. Let's bow our hearts and minds, please. Father in heaven, we, we stand amazed at the great mercy and grace that you have shown towards a fallen race of sinners. By rights, we should be eternally separated from your holiness and goodness. For we have rebelled against you in thought, in word, and in deed. And yet in loving kindness and tender pity, you reached down to fallen humanity and lifted us up seated us together with your dearly beloved Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who died that we might live. Thank you, Lord, for your incredible forgiveness and your amazing grace towards us. Father, I pray that you would light a spark of true forgiveness and mercy in our hearts towards all of those who have harmed or hurt us, whether deliberately or unintentionally, Lord, knowing that it's not only your will for us to show godly mercy towards others, but also that we become equal beneficiaries. When our hearts are flooded with mercy and forgiveness, Lord, Lord, root out, I pray, any lingering bitterness or malice that is lurking within our hearts. And may the godly fruit of mercy and love bud and blossom into true fruit of righteousness. To you, Lord, goes all the honor and the glory. And this I pray in the mighty and matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Lord, have mercy on you guys. Give God the glory. You know? God's grace. You know, it spoke to me all week about this. And I thought it may have been just for me and maybe it was for somebody else here today. You know, grace and mercy. Receive it, but also offer it freely to others without any expectations of even a thank you. Some people are just can't be humbled enough. But our actions speak 
volumes. So I ask you again, once again, to challenge you to do that this week, wherever you are. It might be in the most difficult circumstance. It might be completely out of your comfort zone. It might be in the grocery store watching an elderly person or even a younger person having a difficult time paying for groceries. It might be an elderly neighbor who can't get out. It might be even a younger person that you haven't seen around in a while. But let's extend that grace. Let's be merciful to others.
a better ordinance. Hallelujah. Pray that. He is with us forever. Just one day. 